Welcome and thank you for joining us today in our second panel discussion in a five-part series looking at U.S. election issues through the lens of the 2005 Carter Baker Commission on Federal Election Reform. My name is David Carroll. I'm the director of the Democracy Program at the Carter Center, and we're co-organizing the series with Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, the Carter Center and the Baker Institute are both nonpartisan organizations. We were founded by uh, former President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James Baker. 16 years ago, President Carter and Secretary Baker came together to co-chair a bipartisan commission that made a series of recommendations on how we, we could improve U.S. elections and build confidence in our election processes here at home. Uh, today, uh, election reform continues to rage. Uh, debate about election reform continues to rage. Americans are divided, and politicians are often seeking to exploit those divisions rather to, tr to try to find common ground. Uh, in the spirit of the Carter Baker Commission, we thought it's important to try to bring together smart and reasonable people who can come together and try to discuss these issues in a way to try to uh, identify solutions and improve elections and democracy. We're lucky to have with us today a group of highly regarded election officials and election experts. And they're going to speak about key issues related to absentee ballots and vote by mail. Our panelists today are Kim Wyman, the Secretary of State of Washington, Judd Choate, Colorado's State Election Director, Alice Miller, the uh, Director of the Board of Elections of Washington, D.C., and Tammy Patrick, who's a Senior Advisor to the Election Program at the Democracy Fund. Our moderator, once again, is Doug Chapin. He's the Director of Election Research at the Forbes Marsh Group. And he's also, in the past, he served as the Director of Research for the Carter Baker Commission. Uh, we're gonna kick things off today with a short video after which Doug and our panelists will start the discussion. After the discussion's over, my colleague from the Baker Institute, John Williams, will offer a few closing remarks and will provide information about the next event in the series, which will be one week from today on May 8th. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the discussion. In 2005, the United States was in its fifth year of efforts to reform its election system. The hotly contested and controversial 2000 presidential election had identified flaws in the nation's registration and voting laws that were seen to contribute to a lack of confidence in election outcomes. A 2002 bill called the Help America Vote Act, or HAVA, addressed some of those issues, but failed to settle all of the arguments that had arisen around election reform. For example, State laws requiring voters to provide photo identification were generating backlash amid claims of disenfranchisement. Worry about new voting technology was leading to fears of counting errors. And growing numbers of absentee and mail ballots were raising concerns about the possibility of fraud. In response, former President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James Baker III agreed to co-chair a bipartisan commission housed at Washington, D.C.'s American University to examine these and other outstanding election reform issues. The final report, entitled Building Confidence in U.S. Elections, stressed the important role of elections to the nation's democracy and made a series of recommendations, some controversial at the time, that sought to protect access to polls and the integrity of the election process. Today, many of the challenges that the Commission recognized have been addressed and are now familiar aspects of the American voting experience yet they remain central to current election reform debates. In this panel series, we are revisiting key issues in the Carter Baker Report and assessing how they can help foster constructive dialogue on election reforms. Today's topic is vote by mail. On this issue, the 2005 Commission Report noted the following. While vote by mail appears to increase turnout for local elections, there is no evidence that it significantly expands participation in federal elections. Moreover, it raises concerns about voter privacy and it increases the risk of fraud. The report observed that some states, 
have avoided some of these concerns by introducing safeguards to protect ballot integrity, including signature verification. Ultimately, the Commission recognized the need for more research and accumulated experience in the elections field on both vote by mail and early voting. In the 16 years since the Commission issued its recommendations, new technology and accumulated experience across a number of states have made it easier to safeguard the absentee voting process. Yet concerns about the security of voting by mail remain. In today's discussion, we'll look more closely at this issue, keeping in mind our ultimate goal of building confidence in U.S. elections. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, as David mentioned, my name is Doug Chapin um, with the Forest Marsh Group in uh, Washington, D.C. I'm really honored to be a part of this ongoing panel um, to look at uh, the Carter Baker Report from 2005 and what it can tell us about um, some of the big issues uh, of today. Um, as the, the video mentions, uh, today's topic is um, vote by mail, which became much more important in 2020 um, than maybe it had been in um, previous uh, election years. Um, so really delighted to have um, our panel join us, um, especially Secretary Wyman, um, Tammy Patrick, um, Director Miller. Um, we're still um, um, looking to connect with um, Judge Hoat uh, of Colorado, but I'm hoping he'll be joining us shortly. Um, but want to thank all of you for um, being with us for what we hope will be uh, another um, substantive and um, bipartisan approach to um, this very important issue. Um, Secretary Wyman, if, can I start with you? Um, before we tee off, I mean, obviously, you've been involved um, with vote by mail um, for years. Um, can you give me and the folks listening um, a quick sense of the difference between absentee voting and vote by mail? Uh, sure. The, the main difference between the two is typically an absentee ballot is requested by the voter at some point. They may do it in an ongoing fashion where they do it once and then all future elections are mailed to ballot, or they may be required to do that request on a more frequent basis or maybe by election. In a vote by mail environment, you are, you are sending every eligible voter a ballot preemptively, whether they've requested it or not. And you have voting centers, but really that's for replacement ballots more than anything. And then following up, obviously, you know, you've been um, both first a local election official and now the chief state election official uh, in the great state of Washington, which is now an all uh, vote by mail state. Um, what aspects of your state's approach are um, unique to Washington and what aspects um, are more generally applicable or transferable to other states? Well, you know, I, I think our approach probably was was unique, especially given the challenges of 2020, in that we had about five to 10 years to ramp up from full poll site voting to complete vote by mail. And we did that by voters cho cho choosing that path. Um, they started uh, signing up for permanent absentee balloting in the early 90s. Um, once that happened, we had a majority of our voters casting ballots by, then, by that method. And then in uh, 2004, we had the closest governor's race in the country's history. Uh, and we realized we couldn't do both well. Uh, so we moved over to vote by mail. And it still took five years after we wanted to do that to make it happen. So I think the, the things that are transferable is really building out that capacity, uh, making sure that you have the equipment and the space and the technology to be able to deal with the volumes that uh, you know medium and small size jurisdictions have to deal with and uh, be able to process those. And, and probably the biggest lesson we learned that I think is transferable is the accountability being able to reconcile every single ballot you receive, be able to always be, be able to share with the voters transparently what the disposition of those ballots are and then whether they were counted or not. And if they weren't counted, why not? And, and all of those things take time and resources to build out. Wonderful. Um, so let me go from um, West Coast Washington to East Coast Washington. Um, Alice Miller from the DC Board of Elections. Um, Secretary Wyman talks about having 10 years um, to roll out vote by mail. Um, you and the folks in the district had considerably less time because of um, the experience in 2020. In fact, you all were um, did one of the more rapid implementations of vote by mail as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, what one issue or issues 
um, from that rapid implementation um, stood out the most to you? Yeah, you're right. We probably did this in about a three to four month turnover time. And it was incredibly crazy. And I will say this, um, we relied heavily on those who had done it for a long period of time, such as our colleagues in uh, Washington state. I can't tell you how many times I spoke with and called and cried uh, with, with Laurie Gino, uh, who was the uh, director of elections in Washington state. And she held my hand and got me through it along with a few others. But having said that, one of the things I know for sure that uh, stood out uh, when the, um, we mailed out the ballots, uh, we did use a mail house, uh, which is absolutely necessary to do something like this. Uh, postage, return postage, incoming, outgoing, all of that. And uh, 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 when we saw the ballots coming back in, in record numbers, obviously there was the, re the requirement to be prepared to, um, to process them. And that required resources in terms of um, both the signature scanning, making sure we knew that the ballots were those ballots of individuals um, who we had sent them to, being able to uh, uh, con control and, and, and the number of the volume in terms of the ballots and processing. For example, if we were used to sending out absentee ballots is one thing, but sending everybody a ballot and then the expectation of how they were going to be returned either by, by mail or drop boxes. Every day we were getting volumes and volumes and volumes of ballots back, which meant in order to stay on top of it, we had to have the resources to process them um, on the back end in order to stay uh, current and be able to get that done at the end of the day. So I would say the one thing that we um, needed to make sure of, sure of and build up on were the resources on the back end for processing those ballots. Almost like a be careful what you wish for. You send out all those ballots and somebody <laughs> yeah. sends them back. Well, thank you for being here. Um, sure. Tammy Patrick, um, you've been involved with Vote by Mail for um, quite a while, first as a local election official in Maricopa County, uh, Arizona, uh, and then as a member of the uh, Presidential Commission on Election Administration, and now um, as an advisor to the Democracy Fund uh, here in the D.C. area. Um, what issues to you are most important in the area of um, Vote by Mail right now uh, and why? Yeah, so thanks so much for having me today. And I, um, I want to build upon some things that both Secretary Wyman and Director Miller referenced. So two big things. First, um, I often talk about the evolution of vote by mail. So I want to touch a little bit on that. And then also the way in which the Postal Service has changed in the last 16 years. And then also reference very briefly that we need to remember about some of the contextualizing of what we saw last year and what we've seen historically. So first, the evolution. Um, when we think about the number of people who have voted by mail across the country, I often picture what we refer to as the snow globe of elections that Charles Stewart at MIT has put together. And it basically shows that, you know, 16, 20 years ago, voters were in fact going to the polls on Tuesday. And when voters are provided additional options and when and where to vote, they tend to fall away from that Tuesday voting experience and either migrate towards voting by mail or voting at home or voting early in person. So we know that when voters are given that option, when the excuse requirement is removed, when they're allowed to sign up onto a permanent early voting list, and then that list inflates and gets so large with so many voters that it doesn't make sense, as Secretary Wyman mentioned, to continue to have all of those polling places open on election day when 60, 70 percent of your voters are voting by mail, and you transition to a full-on vote-by-mail system. Now, some states will do that for local elections first, maybe municipal elections can be all by mail and then county elections can be all by mail and then statewide. So there's really this process that we go through. And as we saw in so many states last year, they leapfrog some of those stages and went directly to that full on vote by mail system because of a global pandemic. 
We also need to remember that in the last 10 to 15 years, the Postal Service has changed dramatically in the way in which they process their mail and we receive mail. Mail no longer goes across town. It now goes to a processing plant where it's scanned for both security reasons of um, being able to track ballots, as well as then it's returned back to your home, um, your hometown or city, depending on where the processing plants are. And that takes time. And so we need to make sure that voters understand that. And then lastly, the important piece of this is contextualizing the partisanship or the partisan angles and um, aspects that have been elevated in the last year. Prior to last year, it was absolutely the case that vote by mail and early voting were part of the Republican strategy. Um, and so last year we had a presidential candidate that called into question the legitimacy of that. We had questions around the new um, postmaster general that was, um, was appointed last year. And all of that created really an environment where mis and disinformation um, was allowed to percolate and to spread in such degree that it was weaponized um, against a whole track of, of, of ways in which Americans vote. Tens of millions of voters for years have had their ballots handed to them um, by their postal carrier and not a poll worker. So I think it's really critical in this, in this day and time that we step back and realize what are the decisions that are being made what facts are they based on? Or is this in fact based on um, you know, the spread of misinformation via the social platforms? Um, a perfect example is you know, the audit that's happening in Arizona right now. There's all sorts of things on the internet today about watermarks on ballots. Well, Maricopa County's never had a watermark on a ballot, has nothing to do with what's happening there. But yet we live in an environment where that's being weaponized um, and used as a bludgeon against um, election officials. And that's really true truly um, unfortunate, especially when you think about this all occurring in a global pandemic. Of course, voting by mail was the healthiest way for people to participate and make sure that their voices were heard. And in fact, last year at the beginning of the year in the primaries, about 75% um, of voters were saying, yeah, I'm going to vote by mail in November. But with the rhetoric and all of the information and misinformation that was spread, those numbers actually um, were not you know, anywhere near that. I think we ended up at about 50% of the voters um, cast their ballots. Um, I think it was 48% by mail. Thank you, Tammy. In our first panel uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think um, misinformation and disinformation was um, a huge theme. Um, and unfortunately, vote by mail was not spared during the 2020 elections. I'm gonna come back to auditing and the Postal Service um, in a little while, but I guess I wanna start um, the three of you um, with a more general question. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, really both in the aftermath of 2020, but really generally with the spread of vote by mail about whether or not vote by mail actually increases turnout or at least improves access to the ballot for folks who might not otherwise get it. Um, what do each of you think about that? Um, about just in, in general and in the way vote by mail is implemented uh, across the country. I won't cold call, but a Secretary Wyman wants to go first. I don't, I, I feel bad going first every time, so I didn't want to jump in. Um, you, know, here, you know, we've obviously been uh, doing elections by mail for a long time and have a lot of data. And it really points to probably the biggest impact is on local elections. Uh, we see higher turnout uh, for our bond and levy elections and a special election for example, or our primary elections uh, than our counterparts in other states consistently. And even the bigger elections, a general election, a presidential election, um, we're always within the top six to 10 states for turnout. And I think that's true for all of the vote by mail states. You know, they're all, we're always near the top, but it doesn't guarantee the highest turnout, certainly. And it is one factor of many. Um, but I, I think overall it does engage people because you're reminding them that there's an election you know, 15 to 20 days before, you're sending them a ballot, you're empowering them to vote when it's convenient for them. And the more you do those things, the better your turnout's gonna be. 
Yeah, and I would just echo um, what the secretary is saying that we see in federal elections, it makes a difference of a couple of percentage points. And that I think is tied into the fact that everyone already knows there's an election going on. You can't turn on the TV, the radio, open your mailbox without getting some information around the, around the federal elections. But when we turn to those localized elections, um, when I was in Maricopa County, we saw the percentages increase in double digits over non vote by mail elections. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that for localized elections, those municipal elections, county elections, school, school board, that sort of thing, um, oftentimes people aren't aware that there's even an election going on particularly in states that don't have consolidated election dates. So they could be happening on any random given Tuesday. And that's where I think we really do see a large impact. Um, you know, just recently there was news of, uh, and this happens once every couple of years of elections where no one voted, not even the candidates or their spouses or family members, but we'll set that aside. Um, and that, you know, that rarely happens. I've never seen any of those happening in an all male election. It's always been in person. Um, elections where we see those two, three, four percent turnout. Um, we had an election once, I think it was in 2010, where we had um, basically hundreds of millions of dollars of school board bond elections, and it was an eight percent turnout. That's really um, unfortunate, and that's where I think we do see some some shifting in in the volumes. Let me just <clears throat> piggyback a little bit on that um, from the local perspective um, in DC we had a special election in between our primary and general election. And that was a small local election involving just one um, area of the city. And um, we made the decision to mail everyone a ballot because it was just the thing to do because I didn't wanna deal with a lot of what we went through with the primary. So we just quickly made a quick decision to mail everyone that was involved with that election. It was just a small local election ballot. And I will say, and comparing that to a like election two years earlier, our turnout, although still low, it was um, more than double uh, the turnout for what it was for a similar like election two years earlier with the return of those mail ballots. So with the local elections, I think you're right. It does make a difference with mail balloting. Now with our um, presidential election that we just had, the percentages was up, but not you know, significantly higher. It was a little higher uh, with the all mail balloting, but with the local election, it was more than double uh, when we mailed everyone a ballot. Well, thank you. So let me uh, let me look at from the flip side, right? So um, the the Carter Baker report talked a lot about access and integrity, and obviously um, one of the things we've heard a lot about is the integrity of the vote by mail system. But I know, and I know that you know, um, that there are a lot of safeguards in place to ensure the integrity of the vote by mail process. Um, can you all talk about the various safeguards in place, whether it's signature verification, post-election audits, um, and what have you? I'll jump in first, unless, Alice, were you going to? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead <laughs> we're all good. rubbing so polite to one another. <laughs> and I know all three of us are like, I got an answer. Yeah. Um, so I'll jump in on this one and then uh, leave it to Alice. So one of the things I think is really important that surfaced last year is this question around whether or not voters are legitimately allowed to receive a ballot and whether or not if you just automatically send ballots out or automatically even send out applications became controversial last year um, to registered voters, if that was in some way increasing the amount of fraud that could occur or the amount of challenges or issues that might arise. And here's what I think is, is particularly problematic about that, is that we have safeguards around our voter registration list. Voters who register to vote are in fact taking a proactive step forward to say, I want to vote, I want to participate, I'm interested in this. Um, and they're authenticated in a variety of ways across the states through the Help America Vote Act and the, um, the validation that they are a true and live person, that um, they, in many cases, are coming and appearing to vote or to register in person at a Department of Motor Vehicles location um, or confirming their information through online voter registration. So we know that this is a true and live and accurate person. Otherwise, hopefully they don't get on the voter rolls at all if they're fabricated. So that is the first step. And 
in order to say that the only way that a voter should be able to participate is also to submit an additional application, but yet we don't want election officials sending out those applications. To me, it seems to be this kind of circular argument where in reality, what's being said is that we don't want our registered voters to participate without having to go through a number of additional channels of authentication. Now, that authentication can be really critical on the front end, but we also have authentication on the back end. And so I'm sure that you know my colleagues here um, will have more to say around that, but I wanted to make sure we kind of got in the piece around the application of the voter as having secure channels, whether it means they're filling out an application, um, handwritten with a wet signature, which some states still require, or they're able to fill out that application online, or if they are in fact just sent an, a, a ballot automatically because they are registered to vote and have been authenticated in that way. Yeah, right. So from our end, um, <clears throat> and Doug, I think you hit it, we do have signature verification. Um, every ballot that comes back uh, through the mail, we verify the signature against our um, signatures uh, within our system. And of course it's very time consuming, but that is what we do. We, and then if there's an issue with the signature as to a match, we will not reject the ballot. We put it aside and we ask um, for the voter to, uh, uh, to provide you know, something where they can do, where we can verify that it is the voter's signature. We will contact the voter and we, we go through that process. So we do wanna keep the integrity intact where it needs to be. I will actually say this, I think it's more security with the mail balloting process than there is with in-person. Somebody shows up, they vote, and we don't have voter ID. I'm not being saying that we should. Let me put that out there. But you show up, you vote, your name is on the record, you sign, you go through it. Anyone that, that votes and signs a voter pad, we're not checking signatures, but when the ballot comes back in through the mail, we do check a signature for each and every ballot and verify that that is you know, the person's signature uh, that we have on file on record. If it's not, we go to a... A, a you know two level sort of like process before we make a determination that it's not the voter allowing the voter to provide uh, something additional to do another comparison. So there's a lot of um, uh, a security or integrity put into that. And I will say this: if somebody is doing something that they shouldn't do, first of all, it's illegal, you know, and and there are penalties associated with that. In D.C., it's ten years, ten thousand dollars. So why are we going down that road? Let's have that conversation. There, there are crimes associated with, with fraud for voting and they're high crimes. It's not something that should be or is taken lightly and election officials will definitely um, do what they need to do to ensure that those, those processes are put in place and taken seriously. And I'm, I uh, think that needs to be the, the, the beginning of that conversation when we start talking about fraud and uh, what needs to take place with, uh, with voting. Uh, with mail balloting. I, I would just concur completely with, with both of my colleagues here on, on all points. And I think that the other thing we've seen is this introduction of technology that has allowed states to come up with some really innovative solutions. I, I'm, I'm disappointed that Judd wasn't able to uh, get on the call because Judd showed in Colorado really has helped lead some great innovation uh, that I know Denver uh, County and city uh, elections started of tracking ballots from literally the moment they enter the mail stream to the the voter's door and then once they're reintroduced into the mail stream to counting uh, or being prepared for counting, the voter can individually go online and track their own ballot. And that's one more layer of transparency that just adds to the credibility of the process because we can show a real chain of custody. And you know, mail ballots also have a security level of um, being a paper ballot. So when we get into a contested election, we can always go back and hand count. And right now I find myself doing that a lot. In my state, I have a candidate who was in my own party who lost by over half a million votes and continued to have after election day, this narrative that there was massive fraud. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, you know, these are all tools in the toolbox for election officials. And I think what we all really have to push back on is, is um, you know, Director Miller is absolutely right. These are high crimes and election officials take it seriously. And if you rob a bank, there are consequences. If you commit voter fraud, there are consequences. Um, but the reality is, is that these administrative processes are being politicized. 
and both parties are doing it. So I'm, I'm not picking sides or, or pointing blame on either side. Both, both parties do it. I think right now it's one party doing it a little bit more coming out of 2020. But, you know, we have to push back on, on these claims, especially when they're wild and it is misinformation and disinformation and talk about all of the security measures in place because we have multiple layers and, uh, and that accountability and that reconciliation is, is another part of it. So there you go. And then speaking of reconciliation, um, talk to me a little bit about um, auditing. Obviously, post-election audits have become much more important um, in um, the field, obviously not just in um, vote-by-mail ballots, but um, even in Arizona, where the very, um, I know that I would call it an audit, whatever the procedure is that's going on right now, um, there was an audit that was performed. So. Um, I'll, and I, I would just love to hear from any or all of you, you know, what role does auditing play in the process and how does the fact that we have a tangible paper ballot uh, contribute uh, to that ability? Okay, I'll jump in first because this one just, I'm so tired about hearing of, of forensic audits. I don't even know what that means. What I do know is election officials across the country, including mine here in, in Washington, that's all we do is we create an audit trail in every election, no matter how small or large, from the moment we start defining the election until the moment we get ready, you know, 22 months after the election and, and destroy the, the records that, uh, that need to be, not, that sounds terrible, we get rid of the ballots that are no longer used so we don't junk up uh, storage facilities. Um, all that, every step of the way, we are documenting and auditing and checking and verifying the tabulation machines, we're doing logic and accuracy tests on the coding to, um, to how many ballots we printed, how many we sent to voters, how many we have at polling sites and, and voting centers, how many we, um, we spoiled because they weren't used. All of those audit points, the dual control environment we operate in are like a bank. And that's the easiest way to explain to the average person. An election is like, a lot like a bank. We build in a lot of things to prevent fraud. <laughs> But ultimately, if someone wants to shove a gun into someone's face at a teller, they can rob it. And at the end of the day, they, they'll be prosecuted on the backside and elections are the same way. And we're going to we're going to account for your ballot in the same way your bank accounts for your money. Um, and and yeah, there we go. Yeah. And, and, and let me just piggyback on that. The audit process begins at the very, very beginning of the election process. And not only is it um, the auditing, but it's it's transparent. You know, it's all very transparent. Anyone can come in and watch it and look at it. Uh, we've got videos of it, tapes of it. Um, you can see it. Um, it's nothing secret about it. You know, it's it's all very open and clear for anybody to see. So audits are important. We do them. Um, we let everybody know we're going to do them. We tell you where we are. Come on in, watch. So um, it's a very important part of the process, and it's keeping records is keeping track of things and we keep them for an extended period of time, as Secretary Wyman says, 22 months until after the election um, as required by law. And we keep them, everything is secure in a vault in our situation um, so that no one can get to them in a secure vault and uh, you know, so that they can't get wet and all of that. I mean, we go through very, very high standards. The measures are high to make certain that everything is, is put in a place where it needs to be in a secure manner. So. Uh, we can always go back and, and check our work and make sure that it's okay. And again, it's open for anyone to come in and look at during the process, after the process, um, or anywhere in between. I'll say that what, what is happening right now in Arizona, I find deeply troubling. And I think that all Americans should really be paying attention because this is outside of our democratic norms in this country. I served in Arizona, in Maricopa County, when Arizona implemented the hand count audit. I oversaw our reconciliation or our accounting audit, the balancing of how many people checked in, how many ballots do you have, how many were cast. That's kind of a reconciliation or accounting audit. The hand count audit is a random sampling of, of, of the physical paper ballots or the uh, paper records. We had our touch screens had a verifiable um, paper audit trail. Um, against what the machine said was counted. So I saw all of this starting more than a decade ago and every election, those audits occur in Arizona. They happened in 2020. 
the Arizona's um, hand count audit is actually conducted by the citizens of Arizona. The political parties put, for, put forth bipartisan teams to hand count those ballots, and they found zero discrepancy in Maricopa County. What's happening now is beyond, beyond what normally occurs, as was the forensic audit that the legislature um, called for earlier this year. And the two voluntary or the two voting system test laboratories or VISTLs, because we love our acronyms in elections, there are two test laboratories in this country that test the voting equipment for the United States Election Assistance Commission. Those were the two test laboratories that went in and looked over Maricopa County's setup, their systems, their technology. They found nothing. But that did not answer the and resolve the questions that were in people's mind. So now they have possession in the um, Coliseum in Phoenix of 47 pallets of voting materials, live ballot, you know, the official ballots, equipment, the envelopes. And I'm so concerned because there is a lack of transparency. Yes, it's true that they have cameras on, but the cameras haven't been functioning at all times. They're not allowing the press until today to actually be present. They weren't allowing observers unless you were a, a registered voter in Maricopa County, submitted a resume as along with three letters of recommendation, but they weren't being forthright and forthcoming on who was making the decision on who could be um, an observer or not. These are not typical characteristics of an election audit or an election process that should be open and transparent, all policies, procedures, and determinations. So this is very, very concerning around what's happening in Arizona. And we know that all across the country, legislators and others are leveraging what they believe happened in 2020 in states like Arizona or states like Georgia and using that as information and reasons to make changes in their own states. And that's problematic because they're basing those decisions on mis and disinformation rather than the truth and facts. And that's where I think we all need to be concerned when in fact a, a true and accurate and fair election is still deemed um, unacceptable or called into question um, in the United States because that's the very heart of a free and open democracy is that we believe the outcome of an election, that we have channels to ensure that it was accurate. And so those channels were all exhausted in Arizona they went through the court channels and what they weren't able to get um, an answer that was satisfactory in the courtrooms, they're now taking up under Capitol domes all across the country. And I think that that should have us all um, really paying attention to this to make sure um, that we don't take too many steps backwards. You muted, Doug. Sorry about that. Usually the space bar unmutes me um, so that the dog doesn't disturb me. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to say that um, we're joined by um, my friend and colleague, Judd Choate um, from Colorado. Judd, um, you're coming in on the tail end um, of a discussion about auditing, um, both official audits, which are good, and unofficial audits, which raise um, concerns. Um, Happy to have you weigh in on that, but also just wanted to, as by way of welcome, um, ask you to talk a little bit about um, the so-called Colorado model of vote by mail uh, and some of the aspects of it that you think best address some of the key issues in vote by mail right now. And welcome. Sure. Well, thank you very much. And my apologies for being late. Uh, one of the disadvantages of Colorado is you get a snap 15 inch snowstorm and it knocks out your electricity for 12 hours. And uh, um, I'm up at a part in the mountains where there's no cell coverage. So I just had to patiently wait for the electricity to come back on. Uh, anyway, my apologies. Um, so the uh, Col Colorado model is uh, basically um, what we sort of humorously call the Burger King model. Uh, it's the do it your way. Uh, we mail you a ballot if you're an active voter. Uh, we open a vote center for um, every 25,000 voters around the state, uh, and um, we have expanded election day uh, voting. So it's sort of, if you want to vote early, you can. If you want to vote on election day, you can. That's the 
the idea is to try to meet the consumer where they are at. <clears throat> and we think of our voters as customers, uh, not as people who are filers with our state. So that's the idea of the Colorado uh, model. Um, and uh, so far, I think it's worked pretty well. We, we have a very high turnout and uh, it seems to meet the voters needs to try to aggressively um, uh, get ballots to them in ways that they can securely vote. Um, I, on the on the audit question, and as you you are correct, I'm coming in at the end of this, so I don't know if you've already touched on this, but um, I mean, one of the things that is disturbing about what's happening in Arizona is that it's um, it's upending what is already a a well thought out and um, you know. Uh, legally uh, binding process. So they have statutes that legislators have written, uh, their colleagues and perhaps even uh, those people who voted in favor of this um, extra examination of the ballots, uh, they, um, they are the people who very likely had some hand in writing the current legislation which requires a post-election audit in Arizona. So they are effectively saying they don't believe in the, the audit that they crafted in law. Um, and, the, and there really are ways that we, as an elections industry, can take uh, auditing to the next level. Colorado does risk limiting audits. I believe uh, Secretary Wyman and Washington also does risk limiting audits. There, there are um, really very sophisticated ways in which we can do a full-scale audit of the way in which a, an election was conducted to determine whether the right win winners won, you know, kind of guarantee the proper uh, determination of outcome. And, um, you know, uh, go down that path. If you have concerns that the, that the elections that were conducted in your jurisdiction weren't conducted fairly, there are ways that you can um, uh, verify that outcome without sort of creating this uh, super legislative way of uh, recalculating an outcome, um, which is uh, very heavily weighted on human beings who are the people who um, frankly are the worst counters of ballots. So, um, so there are ways to, to, to overcome those concerns. Doug, I'd, I'd just like to, to add another point and kind of take this up to a whole nother level because going back to this idea of really trying to politicize administrative functions, what we're seeing in Arizona in particular should alarm every American because when you start, you know, when you make a law, ideally, or a policy or procedure about elections, you do it before an election. And everybody knows, you know, in an ideal world, everybody knows what those rules are and they apply in the election, whether you like the outcome or not. And it guides things. And we saw that in 2000. And of course, the Carter Baker report is the, the other side of it where we tried to make sure that those things didn't happen again. We've seen it in many high profile state elections across um, that 20 year span, um, where at the end of the day, what were the rules in place at the time? You know, in, 20, in 2000, we didn't have voter intent rules. Now we do as a result. The problem with what's happening in Arizona is you know the outcome and now you're just making stuff up. We're going to do an audit. We don't have any boundaries around the audit. We don't have any rules. We have no chain of custody. We're giving pallets of ballots and ballot materials to people who have no legal, not only authority, but responsibility, accountability for those materials. So if 10,000 ballots go miss missing, who's going to be responsible? And so, so I'm more worried about the long-term precedence that this action by this legislature is going to have nationally, because guaranteed, and this will not just be Republicans in one state doing it, it will be legislatures on both sides of the aisle, because once you open this door, we can just change the rules if we don't like the outcome. And even if we don't change the outcome, we undermine people's confidence in it. And that's the heart of what I think all of us are saying is, our job is to make the losers believe they lost. <laughs> and now, now you're undermining it. All you have to say is, I don't believe I lost. And because we're in the majority, we get to, to really undermine it at an official level. And it's, it's frightening. And I will just tag on to that, that the elections, just by virtue of having an election, you will have winners and you will have losers. And the losers are never going to believe they lost. 
but traditionally and historically conceding the race is something that was um, just was just an assumption that everyone would do. But once we start having candidates that refuse to concede, even though that concession has no legal bearing, we're seeing it play out in what it means in the public square, what it means to voters. It continues to perpetuate the myth that in fact, their loss was not um, in any way um, correct that there was some sort of malfeasance, something that went awry, not just that they didn't get as many votes. So this is a nice segue to a question that I wanted to ask. Um, and I have a pretty good idea what you're all gonna say, but I wanna hear you say it uh, anyway. Um, legislatures seem to be, I mean, they're always active after elections, but they seem to be especially active right now uh, in the area of election law in, in many states. Uh, to what extent should legislators not just be listening to, but actively consulting election administrators at the state and local level before, during, and after they make changes to election laws? Um, in other words, should legislators be talking to election officials and not just about them? Okay, okay, I'm okay, I'll jump in. Okay, oh. go, Jed. Go, Jed. Well, I was just going to say that I, I feel like we're really lucky in Colorado because uh, we are having those conversations. Uh, first of all, the Secretary, Secretary Griswold, um, who I work for, uh, she leads most of the major pieces of legislation on elections in the state. And then um, to the degree that there are now the sort of election revisionists uh, legislation in our state, those bills are, are dying and they're, and they're dying in committee, um, not with unanimous sort of uh, uh, support and opposition based on par partisan leaning. So um, I feel pretty lucky uh, in Colorado because I know that's not happening everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I'll, um if I can say this, it, it's kind of, it's true in DC as well that we've worked pretty closely with our legislators uh, in terms of uh, uh, crafting and, and drafting the election law. What I find interesting, and it, it may be true other places, even though we do that, after the laws are written and, and put in place and voted on, many of the legislators don't even know what they are. And, um, you know, they, they, they are lost as to processes in, and things that, that come in place and, and the uh, procedures that need to happen. Um, but they do, they will work with us, but is there, they, we should be the ones that, because we don't have a personal outcome in this as legislators do, we're, we're, we're neutral. You know, we're just, we just want to make sure our thing is about the process and the, and the procedure to make sure that it can work. It can work in, this, in the jurisdiction and we know how to, how, how to do this with the voters with the, with the intent of making it work, not with trying to predict the outcome because our role is not to determine the outcome. We don't care about the outcome. We just want it to work. I think Director Miller points out a really important um, change that's occurred in the last 10 or 15 years. So 10 or 15 years ago, um, oftentimes election officials said, you know, I don't wanna weigh in on legislation. I don't wanna be part of, um, of who sets the rules that I have to live under. I would, you know, I take the rules and the laws as they come to me, and that's the election that I conduct. But what they saw is in that vacuum, they were getting some really bad legislation. So now it's more of a stance that local, state and local election officials feel that they should not weigh in on for or against many bills, that's often the case, but instead weigh in on what are the impacts, how could it be implemented, how can the legislation be improved, how can it be more fiscally responsible, or how can it be expanded to get um, more bang for the buck um, that the legislation might be putting forth? And I think that that has been a real change over the last decade or so, and continue, we continue to see that. This legislative session, I've seen more um, state and former election officials testifying in state legislatures around the country on what are the best practices. Um, NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislators has, or legislatures, has a lot of information and their members are definitely utilizing it 
Um, so I, I think that we're on a good trajectory, but the challenge is, is that there still seems to be particularly this year, this introduction of um, of trying to politicize and literally putting thumbs on scales on the way in which elections are being conducted. And quite frankly, quite often it's based on misinformation themselves, thinking that by putting their thumb on that scale, they're only going to affect other voters, not their voters. And in fact, we know that these restrictions impact voters of both political parties, all political parties, um, and um, and it should never be the case that a legislator is um, is putting forth legislation in order to try and impact the outcome of an election. Yeah, and here in Washington, uh, definitely what Tammy just discussed, we've we've seen where um, our local election officials really pulled back. Oh, we we don't want to set policy. We, we'll let the legislature tell us, and we'll just do whatever. And I think. What I've seen, you know, now that I've crossed over, I guess some would say to the dark side and I'm on the state side now, what we've seen is uh, particularly in 2020, a couple laws that were passed, they had to implement and, you know, they're calling us going, what, what do you mean we have to do this? It's like, yeah, that's what the law says. <laughs> what, what do you mean we have to have, you know, I don't want to point out the exact laws, but they were, it was a wide expansion of access. So it's, the, it's in reverse. Um, the Democratic Party has control um, of all of both chambers and the governor's office. And so you had this wide expansion of access and our office and the auditors did a lot of things to build in the security measures to compensate that. But there were a couple of bills that the administration was really onerous. And I think it's what's what it's taken for our auditors to realize that they need to step up and they need to be at the hearing talking about the cold hard reality of what it's going to take to process that bill. And, um, and legislators don't want to hear about the wonky administrative side of our work, but they need to. And they absolutely need to be talking to election officials. And that's not just state legislatures, that's Congress as well. And I think that that's what um, is so frustrating about some of the, the HR1 and S1 and some of the bills that are being introduced is you haven't talked to the folks that are gonna have to implement these bills, you need to. And, and I think that's always gonna be our message. Can I add one other little thing? Or, or Alice, if you wanted to go. No, I was just gonna piggyback actually on what you said, um, Tammy, and that is uh, from the perspective of you implement these bills and you put these things in place, but then there's a cost, uh, you know, to get it done. And oftentimes they forget about that. You know, they just want you to do it, but no one's taken the time to examine the fiscal impact. And oh, you need money to do this? Uh, yeah, that would help. You know, and and that that becomes very important, and and it's sufficient cost. That's what you know. You don't necessarily have to do the. It's a good idea, bad idea but just the impact and what it's gonna to take to do it and how to do it and what we need to get it done. That's, that's where it becomes important. That, that's all I wanted to say. And I was just gonna add real quickly is that we know from some of the um, early academic studies of what happened last year, that in fact, Republicans got a bump in vote by mail um, last year. And oftentimes when we think about these access laws, they help every everyone, all water you know, rises, all boats or whatever the saying is that I always get wrong. Um, and that's why when you talk about something like ballot curing is another thing that we haven't talked all that much about, but ballot curing is really quite frankly, often and only referred to as a customer service element where I have always see it as a security element as well. And what ballot curing does is if there's a lack of signature, if the signature doesn't mismatch, is mismatched or doesn't seem to match after it's gone through a tiered review, that you reach out to that voter and find out why. Is it good customer service? 100%. But is it also a security measure to find out why does the signature not match? Absolutely. And so when I made those calls, people would say, oh, I, I recently suffered a stroke. I can't believe you're calling me. My signature has changed or their arm was in a cast or what have you. But without that kind of reach to the voter to find out what was going on for both customer service and security, um, you don't know what's happening. And that's where I think far too often both sides of the aisle, we like to latch onto one narrative around a policy when in fact it's always far more complicated than anyone wants to um, wants to believe or give give time to. And speaking of something that's I think a lot more complicated, um, but is incredibly uh, important. Um, I said I'd get to this and now I am. Um, Want to talk about the changes at the Postal Service. Um, obviously, Tammy, you've brought up the change in the delivery model and how um, service times have lengthened, uh, which makes um, vote by mail more challenging. We've also seen concerns about um, capacity changes. 
um, either budgetary or for some other reason at the Postal Service. Um, what are the key issues facing election officials with regard to the Postal Service right now? Um, and what can both election officials and people who care about the election process do to ensure that the Postal Service is still able to play its role? And I'll throw that out to everybody, not just Tammy. Just I'll be really brief then on the Postal Service side of things. It's really important to know that capacity is not really an issue when you talk about letters and flats, which is what ballots are are considered um, packages, however, in a global pandemic when everybody's shopping online and at home, that's a whole different thing. So quite often when we hear about capacity, um, those two things get put together. One of the most important things that election officials can do is what was referred to earlier, and that is to use ballot tracking. Make sure that they're using intelligent mail barcodes on their ballots. Um, in 2018, the Postal Service created a ballot service type ID to increase the visibility of ballots in their mail stream to make sure that they know where ballots are. Um, so now we just need election officials to make sure that those um, tracking implements are on, on the envelopes. Legislators need to address um, the dates and deadlines for when a voter can sign and make sure that they also allow for, um, for ballot curing. And the Postal Service needs to continue their efforts to really enforce their policies that have been in place for years, including things like prioritizing ballots, doing the processing plant sweeps, um, ensuring that postmarks um, are occurring on ballots. Unfortunately, there's been some reporting um, of last year where there wasn't a lot of a accountability being held when those traditional and standard practices were not being done. And we need to make sure that um, we have a postmaster general in place um, and a board of governors in place that will ensure that those policies and procedures are not only being articulated verbally, but are actually being done um, in the plants. Yeah, I'll agree. I think the intelligent mar mail barcode is is absolutely 100% um, necessary for sure. Um, that that helps significantly with voters being able to track their ballots. And and I'm I'm going to step out here a little bit more um, aggressively than than Tammy and just say you got to put pressure on um, on on the postal service. Um, I think we kind of did that from an election official's perspective which resulted in um, getting things taken care of a little differently than what I believe uh, thought was going to happen. And so we were able to, 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 um, to get some um, support and agreement with these mail ballots being uh, uh, processed a lot quicker than, than initially it was thought it was gonna happen. So that has to continue, not only from an election official's perspective, but from members of the public as well. I mean, um, everybody needs to jump on and say, hey, we want our mail, you know, and we there isn't a reason why we shouldn't be able to get it, especially when it comes to something as important as a ballot and the ballots being processed through the mail, as Tammy says, it's a flat that take, you know, 10, 20 days to get a letter. That's 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 ridiculous. Yeah, and one of the things I think, again, having a long ramp up of uh, to vote by mail is the relationships you build with your local postmasters, your, you know, the the, the team that's in your region. Uh, you know, we did a uh, postal task force here in Washington that kind of dovetails nicely into the national uh, postal task force. And so our counties are really engaged and they are, they know the, the people in charge in our region, they know their local postmaster. And, you know, they're once a year at least are meeting with them to talk about the upcoming year and they're getting into the weeds of just the processes. So when things happen like they did last year, you already have those relationships established and you can kind of just ask the hard question. So what does this mean? And, and then the counties can make their adjustments as they need to. You know, I, I had probably a third to half of my counties who mailed a full week earlier than they normally would. And we saw tremendous benefits from that. In fact, now they're starting to all think maybe we should be mailing out earlier. And, you know, so it's a relationship building as it always is very important. Uh, and then I'll, I'll just um, add basically to everybody's pieces. Um, the, unfortunately, we had to sue the USPS uh, twice last cycle. We joined uh, the Washington lawsuit um, and then we had our own lawsuit. And uh, I just feel like there, there was just some really poor management of uh, the United States Postal Service um, in the months leading up to the election. Um, a great example was a postcard that was sent out to all of our 
addresses in which it said, um, you know, sign up to, to get your mail ballot. Uh, well, in Colorado, you don't have to sign up to get a mail ballot. And then it said, uh, remember, you have to mail in your ballot no later than seven days prior to the election. Well, in Colorado, 75% of the ballots that are returned in an election are hand delivered and you have through election day to be able to hand deliver that. So we were very worried about misinformation coming from our own government about the way we conduct our election. And, uh, you know, that's just about lousy management. And um, when we confronted the United States Postal Service about uh, the wording on that, on that postcard, uh, they were they were very enamored with the wording um, and could find no problems whatsoever, even when we pointed them out to them. Uh, so we had to go to federal court and get uh, what is pretty much the the most aggressive U uh, U.S. district court opinion I've ever read, where a judge basically said uh, the United States Postal Service um, was wildly in the wrong, and. Um, and even after that, they, they frankly uh, still kind of stood by their policies. So I, I feel like it's a management issue. We have great relationships and uh, we have good policies uh, that have been built up over years and years. And, and um, we just need them to work with us to do things which will you know, make election mail work. And uh, we just didn't get a lot of that last cycle. So I would just have a little bit of time left, but we've had a couple of really, I think, interesting questions from um, the audience that I'd like to, um, to toss out. Um, the first is on the cost of vote by mail. Um, and the question is whether or not um, vote by mail systems are more expensive than other um, systems. Um, the, 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 the questioner is asking, is there standardization in cost among 50 states? The answer to that is no. Um, that the uniform system we have is that everyone does it differently and can't believe it. No one does it like they do. But um, to folks here um, and Alice, um, given that you all were sort of on a forced march um, to um, vote by mail, is vote by mail um, more expensive than other systems? Um, um, if so, why? If not, why not? It's not inexpensive. Um, <laughs> We, we had to obviously ramp up to get this done. So some of the things that we had to put in place this year, we will have in place going forward. Um, the, obviously the, the postage, we did return postage, as I said, in going, outgoing. So that won't, that won't change. That will still um, uh, be, a, be a cost that we'll have to put out. I, again, the mail house, I will never do this without having the support of, um, of a third, of a vendor taking care of the mailing so that will be a consistent cost. Now, what we did do this time that I think will, will minimize some of the costs is we had a lot of uh, vote centers open. And so we needed to balance the number of vote centers um, against what was really needed with the return of the ballots um, coming in by mail, but we had nothing to, to judge it with and couldn't base on anything. And some of, you know, some of our, um, uh, uh, elected officials were a little worried. So there was some force to keep more vote centers open than uh, we kind of felt were necessary. And so that then dealt with hiring poll workers and you know paying for, for vote centers and extending those periods a little longer. So, so we did put out quite a bit of money, but I think going forward, even though it may not be less, it certainly wouldn't be any more. Um, on the convenience factor, it's easier uh, to process for, on our end, obviously, because we, we wouldn't need the poll workers or, or the number of poll workers or the number of um, polling places and the, and the amount of equipment and all of those kinds of things, which would be minimized um, going forward if we were to continue to do more mail balloting, even though we'd have vote centers, it just wouldn't be um, um, the, the number and so everything would gradually be reduced so that uh, folks would be more used to, to getting the mail ballot and responding to mail ballots, which still everyone did uh, vote it by mail ballot more so this time than they did showing up in person um, uh, and voting in person uh, uh, for the November election. 
Judd, I feel like you've got kind of a unique perspective on this, given that Colorado has seen lots of changes over the last decade um, or so. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. cost? Yeah, and we and we've kept track of costs and the uh, the cost of shifting. And Alice is right. Uh, when you gear up to be a vote by mail jurisdiction, uh, there is upfront costs that are um, larger than a traditional election. But very quickly over time, you will begin to save money, and uh, you'll save a lot of money because the largest expense in an election is uh, humans. And uh, you will not need as many humans running a vote by mail election as you will running an in-person or polling place election. So um, if you uh, reduce by a third or, or even half the number of human beings you need to hire for a given election, you're gonna save a lot of money. And as you become more familiar and more comfortable with the technology and begin to be able to process those ballots more quickly, um, and and build up signatures so you can do signature verification quickly. It's just a it's it's a much easier, much more streamlined process. So we anticipate that our jurisdictions save you know around a third of what they uh, it would cost them if they were running polling place elections. And I would just add to that the most expensive way to run elections is to run all the elections all in all ways. So. Uh, M making sure that a voter has to send in an application. Last year, our back of the envelope cost seemed to right around a dollar um, is a fairly conservative estimate for each voter that has to send in an application for each election. Um, also, you get efficiencies if you move to a permanent list where um, you don't have to process hundreds of thousands. When I was in Maricopa County, we were processing hundreds of thousands of applications for every election. We couldn't get them in the system fast enough to get the ballots out to voters. So when you do that, you also, your ballots are going out in, you know, across a greater amount of time. Whereas if you have a permanent list or you go all vote by mail, all your ballots are mailing out within a given timeline and you can get cost efficiencies by mailing in bulk. There are all sorts of other things that you can do to cut down your costs um, that you incur if you spread out that practice over days or even weeks. So there are a lot of economies of scale that can be um, that can be done. You still want to allow voters to have some in-person um, options. And I don't think anyone is articulating that if you go to an all vote by mail option, you should not allow voters to have some in-person access points or um, or perspectives, you know, places where they can go because that's that's truly critical. And far too often that gets conflated um, by people saying, oh, they just want everybody to vote by mail and not be able to vote in person. And that's not the case when you listen to actual election officials. Yeah, I would I would mirror everything everyone has said already. And I, I think what our experience here was we transitioned over to vote by mail right when HAVA was being implemented. And it was uh, that was the hardest decision I made as county auditor was to make the call to cut over completely to vote by mail. But it was absolutely driven by how much our costs at the polling places would go up. And I couldn't justify this huge expense when, when only 40% of my voters or 30% of my voters were even gonna be eligible to go there. Um, what we found in the long run is it's kind of a wash, but that those efficiencies have really been gained. And I think the other thing, when I look back at 2004, which was the last time we were a, a poll site state, we depended on people, hundreds of people, thousands of people who worked in each county on election day that if we were lucky, we got to train for two hours a year. If we were lucky, they worked for us six days a year. And the full success of the election rested on these temporary workers who worked a 16 hour day, their average age was 70, and they were set up to fail, quite honestly. So, you know, I think we've gotten better with, with um, modern era, you know, voting centers and polling places and things, but it's still very labor intensive, as, as Jed was saying. And, um, and there's a lot of risk, I think, and a lot of, a lot of uh, potential for error because you just don't have the resources to really make those polling places and vote centers completely successful. Hey, just one more thing on that, Doug. Please. Um, it, that uh, really all vote by mail is, is a ballot delivery device. You can either come in and we will hand you a ballot across a counter or we will mail it to you. That's all vote by mail is. And so it, like Tammy was saying, 
uh, you can vote that at home or you can come in in person. You can bring your ballot in person and vote it in person if you'd like. Uh, we'll put you in front of a machine and you can vote it on a machine. I mean, all, all it is is an effort to get a ballot into the hand of a voter. Um, I, I think people see it as much more conspiratorial or they, they, they see it as, as kind of a big policy choice. It's really not. It's just a way to get the ballot there. Well, wonderful. We're just about ready to wrap up. Um, I, one more question and just kind of a speed round with everybody. Um, we've talked a lot about misinformation and disinformation. What's one thing you think folks can do to help assure voters that vote by mail is not as problematic or is as um, useful um, as you all believe it is? Well, I, I, I think it goes back to auditing and, um, and then getting the word out. Uh, you, you have to have a good process, a process that's public, something that people can see and be a part of. We, most of our major jurisdictions film it. So they, the whole thing is live streamed. Um, and, and, uh, and then get it into the press, get it into people talking about it. We post on Facebook and on uh, Twitter and so forth so that people can talk about the good news, talk about the right uh, information as opposed to sort of conjure up the wrong. I would say the increased use of that ballot tracking and having a system that pushes out the information that doesn't rely on the voter to have to go out and poll so they don't have to go to the website to put in the information about you know, who they are and then see the status of their ballot, that they get an automatic text message that pushes through to them saying that their ballot was received and the signature was verified. Um, promoting things like the Postal Service informed delivery, which is a service that any American, any household um, can sign up for. And every day you get an email that shows what's in your mailbox so that voters can see, oh, my ballot's in my mailbox today. It should be there when I get home or I'll stop by at the post office and pick it up, pick it up out of my PO box. There are things like that that we can do that provide the information to the voter um, free and of, of you know absolutely no no charge and really of no additional effort on behalf of the voter other than for them to sign up for it. Yeah, so I agree with all of that, and we did a lot of um, of each of those things. But one other thing that I, that I think is important is um, from our end, uh, we held a lot of town hall meetings where we actually spoke with people. And we had one-on-ones with individuals who may not have had access to technology, for example, but we could um, meet with them um, uh, and tell them what was going on and what to expect and how to expect it and, and, and ask them to pass it on to their family and friends and, and, to, and to know what the information is and to know what to look for. And, and if you have questions, you know, call us or whatever. So again, the one-on-one -on -one communication with individuals in addition to all of that, I think is, is important and it worked well for us. So that's something else to consider as well. And, and I think just, you know, again, to harp on this partisanship issue, I, I think that election officials across the country need to be transparent, get out in communities and share what we do. But also when, when legislators or whoever start becoming partisan, dial it back in and get back to the administrative checks and balances showing the access and the security that yes, we send every voter a ballot, but here are the security measures and always having that conversation, always taking it back there every time they have an interview, every time they're in front of a group, because I think we have to just keep rebuilding that, that um, confidence that people have in, in the system. And, and we are the ones who have the, the ability to do that influence and, and take, that, take it away from the partisan diatribe and put it into the administration and the, the role that it has in our democracy from that perspective. Well, thank you. Thank you to all the panel. This has been, um, Amazing. Um, I um, I knew we were getting um, an all-star panel, uh, and you all absolutely delivered. Want to thank you all for being with us. Um, going to thank um, everyone for joining us, and then I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague John Williams at the Baker Institute. John, thank you, Doug, and thank you as well to our panel members. It was a very thoughtful conversation, one that we hope can stir the brand of bipartisan approach that is needed to help us address these challenges and others that face our nation. Please join us for our next program that starts at 12.30 p.m. Easter time on Wednesday, May the 5th. The topic of that program is voter registration and voter ID. 
Until then, please stay healthy, make sure you get your vaccinations, and continue to wear masks and observe social distancing recommendations. Thank you again, and good day.